<laughs> okay. Good afternoon. Welcome to the first of two talks this quarter in CTL's award-winning Teachers on Teaching series, and thank you so much for being here today. I'm Michelle Marinkovich, Associate Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education and Director of the Center for Teaching and Learning. I have the honor of introducing today's speaker, Professor Robert Siegel of Microbiology and Immunology, whose talk on Adventures in the Edusphere, Reflections on a Career in Academia, gives you a good hint of the wonderful pedagogical ride that I think we're about to embark upon. And thank you so much, Bob, for being willing to share your zest for teaching. I hope all of you notice that a week from today, actually, I don't see uh, flyers out, but there will be the second talk in the series a week from today in this same room when Professor Daphne Kohler of Computer Science will bravely try to help all of us understand the huge change that is suddenly taking place in classes and on teaching when she speaks on the online revolution high quality education for the 100%. Not just the 99, but the 100%. So, but back to today and today's speaker, Professor Robert Siegel, a triple degree Stanford alum and an associate professor teaching in the School of Medicine. Bob received his bachelor's degree in psychology from Stanford in 1976, followed the very next year by a master's from our School of Education. He then completed a PhD in molecular biology from the University of Colorado Boulder before returning to Stanford and completing an MD in 1990. An incredibly rich and challenging background. <laughs> Bob started teaching at Stanford shortly thereafter and began compiling an almost unprecedented list of teaching awards on campus of which I'll only be able to give you some of the highlights. In 1990, he received the School of Medicine's Dean's Award for Outstanding Teaching in two areas, in undergraduate virology and in human biology. In 1994, he received the Peter and Helen Bing Award for Outstanding Teaching. In 2000, the ASSU Distinguished Teaching Award in 2006, the Henry J. Kaiser Award for Excellence in Preclinical Teaching, and in 2011, the Walter J. Gores Award for Excellence in Teaching, which is arguably Stanford's highest award for teaching. So note that he has been recognized by awards from students, by awards from deans, by awards from fellow faculty. So Bob has ch touched every population. I hesitate, however, to try to identify the secret of Bob's success, especially since that might preempt what he is about to talk, to talk about. But clearly, this is a man who has discovered his passion and knows how to fully share it with the rest of us, both the joy and the excitement. And he's also willing to take risks including wandering from science into both poetry and photography. I urge you to look at his online photo albums as he explores not just the diseases and the problems of this world, but the wonders of it. I am so pleased to be able to present Professor Robert Siegel. So I'm going to talk about adventures in the edusphere, reflections on a career in academia. Uh, we, let's see. So, uh, so my first question, if somebody has an MD and a PhD, is that a paradox? OK, so thank you, Michelle. And I hope you can tell that I'm honored by this opportunity. Now, 
I actually had to worry when I was coming over that maybe Michelle wasn't going to introduce me, so I had to think of a new verse. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, for public reflections and making connections here today with the Stanford community, my thank you extends to family and friends and colleagues who made it today, and also to those who this hour chose to hear what I might have to say. That's my family. Actually, it's kind of a lie because the youngest one's about to go off to college. Yeah. Um, but if I've been lauded and sometimes applauded, the students deserve all the credit. Because we excel, we, because they excel, we are bound to do well, and it need, it, though it needn't be mentioned, I've said it. Uh, they say those who can do, but that's only a few, and those who can't do become teachers. Those who can't teach or for whom it's a reach teach teachers from their ivory bleachers. So how to proceed and filling what need, alluding to what situations? And just where to start, what pearls to impart that might supplement your educations? Okay. Um, some of you may not know about this, but the students do. So. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. How to deliver a talk where the giver has mastered what balance to strike? while forming conjectures of lectures on lectures and what meta lecture you like. I think it was Will Robert Rogers who said, I never met a lecture I didn't like. <laughs> okay. Something amusing and not too confusing, but peppered with purpose and pith, including ideals and heartfelt appeals and all of the things they go with. To search for a phrasing that's simply amazing, perceived best by those in the know, consulting with Google on verbiage frugal, and trying to find the just mo. Okay. Though some of these references surely have preferences for those who are inside the loop, some are directed at those who are connected to each pedagogical group. Education, we're taught, provides food for thought in forms that are savory and lippity. But along with the meats, there must also be treats with humor and some serendipity. Filled with instruction and subtle deduction with inference beyond innuendo. And when, we, and when nearing the end, no more point, points to defend. Comprehension is at its crescendo. <clears throat> then it occurred to me that using history based on my personal stories might be an effective way towards my objective if drawn from diverse categories. Throughout my career, I have tended to steer toward courses on topics contagious in giving polemics on human pandemics using methods from banal to outrageous. Okay, this is the game pandemic, if any of you have played. She's nodding. Uh, I check every fact in a fashion exact in my efforts to try and prepare. So it's hard to ignore the, uh, the topic du jour by using meticulous care. First, I check in the media, then Wikipedia for validating each source then to the literature till it's considered sure before vetting ideas in each course. Okay. <laughs> so make no mistake, there's no risk I won't take, no bathos to which I won't sink. Costumes and props or clever synopses, if that's what will get this, if, if that will, synopses, if that will get students to think. Okay, so here's some of my costumes that I've employed in the past. Uh, with models created and Twitters updated, uh, plush toys you uh, just can't go wrong. So uh, many of you have seen my collection of plush toys. There's Flu. This is uh, Mad Cow. Yeah. With each caveat, there's the proper cravat, or perhaps I might invoke a song. So this is actually, up here you see the, the, uh, the tie from Infectious of Wearables uh, for Pandemic Flu. I decided today to go with the Ebola tie, so in case you want. An interesting virus is sure to inspire us, and Darwin is always a must. Throw in photography and some iconography, meme chew I always can trust. Now, by the way, those things, if for people who don't know it, uh, when students are sitting in class and they're looking intently at their computers, uh, what they're actually doing is going through all the meme chews that are online, of which there are thousands. Um, and it's called meme chew because it's the, the, they were called the Stanford memes, but uh, Stanford said, you're violating our copyright. So they turned it into 
uh, mean to, to take up a mean to. Amidst all the theories and challenging queries that help to merge facts and conjectures and punishing phrases in various phases adorning my handouts and lectures, and just to give you an example of some of these uh, punishing phrases, I've, here are the, the, uh, the titles for a couple of my lectures on herpes. First, there's uh, Minding Herpes and Cues, and then there's Herpes, a Recurrent Theme. Uh, Okay. While crossing the line in a costume bovine, what students speculate I must be on? But it's almost the norm with disease spongiform and a topic so maddlingly prion. And when I asked my son what I should do for this talk, he said uh, I should wear my cow suit. Okay, so I, <laughs> I did did bring my cow hat, however. And if you should sneeze or have a disease, even now while, I'm try to, while I try to address you, to control that infection, just heed my direction. Take care of that virus and bless you. I often use travel to try and unravel the intricacies of a topic while students begin to try to take in perspectives from broad to myopic. But whether we fit in while traveling in Britain or Tanzania or in Tanzania we roam, from Chiloé Island to New Guinea Highland, or ventures much venues much closer to home. This is actually in front of, in Kew Gardens, in front of the Evolution House. Or even when leaping or off the road jeeping, there's quite a great deal to discern, uh, as our observations can be a sensation when we're actively trying to learn. This is in the Great Rift Valley with my uh, class. Uh, here we are off the road jeeping. So let it suffice now to end with advice of a possibly practical type. Let go of your fears of future careers and try and escape all the hype. In your studies, explore go beyond what's before in your thinking and never be sorry. And try to be smart with your brain and your heart because learning's life's greatest safari. OK, thank you. Uh, so I teach. Um, and that's the main thing I do. And uh, some people say I'm actually good at it. Uh, that may or may not be the case, but I can tell you one thing. I really, really love it. Uh, what an extraordinary privilege to be able to teach at Stanford. At Stanford. Uh, many of my colleagues have confided in secret that they, would, uh, that they find it amazing that, we're, uh, that Stanford's willing to pay us to do this stuff and that they'd be willing to do it for free. Shh, don't tell anybody. Uh, but every morning I wake up and I say to myself, I'm a professor at Stanford in an extraordinary environment teaching some of the most talented students in the world among amazing and brilliant colleagues. Then I say, oh shit, I have so much stuff to do, I'm never going to finish it. Uh, but the magic does carry on. Uh, uh, and that's why when somebody asks me, for those of you who know uh, how I'm doing, I rarely say, okay. Anyway, I'm a, I'm a professor, uh, a little bit different than some of the people here, who uh, spend a lot of my time professing. Uh, I often teach many classes per year, many, many classes a year, although the classes range in size, scope, and intensity. Uh, I teach things from one-unit uh, tutorials uh, to six-unit, two-quarter behemoths. They're actually 12-quarter, two-quarters, two, 12, six units each quarter. And for many years, I taught a nine-unit uh, uh, monster to the medical students. Uh, I teach classes that range uh, from classes that meet once per week uh, to three-week intensive classes that might meet more than 10 contact hours per day, including weekends. Uh, I teach classes that lightly touch on a range of topics to those that drill down in great depth on topics. I uh, teach classes that go from pure lecture. The 12-unit uh, the behemoth is about 120 hours of lecture on virology. Uh, to, um, um, to classes that are entirely discussion. Um, I teach classes that are heavily, heavily reliant on technology, usually to my chagrin, uh, to classes that use virtually no technology at all, uh, especially those that are in the field. I teach classes from Palo Alto uh, to Europe, South America, Africa. Uh, I teach classes uh, uh, and a range of topics from human virology, phot photographing nature, Chilean uh, Antarctica, issues of development in northern Tanzania, uh, classes uh, on the evolution of Darwin, uh, and so on and so on. Now, each class is different, 
uh, and each class is an experiment. Uh, and each class teaches me new things about teaching. Um, and I try to be an eager student when I teach these classes uh, and try to figure out what, the, uh, what I'm actually uh, uh, learning from the class. So classes teach us a great deal. Uh, most of you are probably aware of the adage that if you really want to learn about a topic, you should uh, uh, teach a class on it. And I certainly take that to heart. Uh, so uh, usually I, I may know a lot about it to begin with, or I may know a lot about it at, by the end. Uh, however, the classes also teach you a great deal about teaching. And I guess throughout my career, I've, I've also spent about half of my time when I go to a lecture uh, listening to the content about half of the time, uh, listening to how it's delivered and why it's effective or why it isn't effective. Now, I wish I could tell you that uh, all I've learned about teaching, but that would, of course, take a course. Um, so I'm just going to give you some uh, vignettes. And this, this talk doesn't actually have an ending. Uh, when I run out of time, I'll just stop telling you stories. Uh, so, uh, and then when you ask me questions, I'll tell you some more. Uh, okay, so uh, in fact, one of the, uh, the hardest things to do was to try and to compactify this talk. Uh, for those of you who've been my students, uh, uh, many of you have heard me lecture for three hours at a stretch, uh, and uh, I've had classes that run as long as five hours uh, or even three weeks uh, continuously. Okay, so I, I, in, it's actually hard to talk about teaching, uh, uh, especially. Uh, with a build-up like award-winning teachers on teaching. Uh, I, uh, one of the, I've been to a lot of these talks, and one of the things I really most looked forward to uh, was actually hearing Michelle's introduction. And once again, it was a great thrill. And I did come up with rhymes for Marinkovich as well. Uh, so, but for me, it's much, much easier to talk about viruses, uh, something uh, nice and concrete. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, okay, it's actually been a great thrill. Now, now just getting to the point of, uh, of the fact that uh, what I do is teach, uh, this is how my emails are signed. And uh, uh, I'll just go through a little bit of this. Uh, so first of all, I, 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 this is my pointer. Uh, I'm an associate professor, and I'm actually in the parenthetical teaching line. And I actually think that's really wonderful, uh, since it acknowledges the main thing I do, which is teach. Uh, and it's also wonderful that Stanford actually has this line. And, uh, and you may have heard various things about what Stanford considers about teaching. But, but I, I've been absolutely delighted by, uh, by the opportunities and also the recognition that I've received. Uh, the next thing you see up here is I actually am a member of three different departments, uh, somewhat diverse uh, and sort of expanding. Uh, I've also been in some other ones like biochemistry. Uh, the common thread here basically is pretty much uh, infectious disease. Uh, and I'm going to tell you some stories about how I got into these different departments, because it actually shows uh, a lot about luck and serendipity. Uh, but it's kind of fun to be uh, uh, something at the medical school, undergraduates, and then uh, Center for African Studies. Uh, um, also, uh, it's great to have a Stanford address. Uh, it's amazing uh, how, how effective that can be at times. And then I'm very proud of my uh, website. I actually was using the web. Uh, very early in the web game, and I actually created class pages before there was anything like course. Bless you. Take care of that viral infection. Um, so uh, before there was anything like coursework, uh, and I've actually early on actually asked my, uh, my students to even create web pages so they would understand this thing that I thought might be important. Okay. So uh, imagine the, the most effective, your favorite teacher that you've ever had, and, and what impact they've had. And now think about what it might like to actually be that person. It's really sort of daunting and wonderful sort of uh, uh, thing to think about. Okay. Okay. Now, this is what uh, I just I stole this, actually. But uh, this is uh, uh, what professors, this is what my parents think I do. Okay. C equals MC squared. Okay. That's what my son does, actually. But uh, OK. Uh, this is uh, what my friends think I do. And, and um, since I spend something like uh, three or four months a year uh, uh, doing Stanford teaching uh, abroad, uh, that may be close to the case. Uh, this is what my uh, students think I do. That looks a lot like my office, actually. Uh, here's what my spouse thinks I do. This is what my colleagues think I do. Actually, these are probably reversed. Uh, OK. 
And, uh, and this is what I actually do. That's, what I, that's probably a real picture of my office if you want to come by. It, it doubles as a movie set. Okay. And th there were a lot of, uh, although it's difficult to give this lecture, there's also a lot of great fallout when you give a talk like this. So I received this email uh, two days ago from somebody who saw I was giving the lecture. It turns out this is actually the person who was my supervisor in the STEP program. Now, the last time I heard from this person uh, was, actually 30, uh, was actually in 1977. So this is 35 years ago. So, so it's really wonderful what the, uh, what the internet will do. And uh, I, I was actually quite touched that he sort of remembered me as a teacher from that time. Uh, so, and now we've been in a very interesting active dialogue uh, back and forth about teaching uh, as a result of that. Okay, so. Okay, so, uh, so in trying to think of what I should do during this talk, uh, I, I thought about all kinds of pedagogic things I could talk about and how the nature of teaching has changed over the years. Uh, uh, but then uh, I, I actually hearkened back to some advice I got from, uh, from Bill Durham one time. I was trying to decide what, uh, what sophomore college to teach, and I had a whole long list of things. And he said to me, teach the one that's the most fun. Okay? And you're going to hear about that class in just a little while, because uh, it was uh, uh, a, a kind of a memorable uh, sophomore college. OK, so the other thing that I do is I often, uh, in order to sort of multitask uh, exercise and advising, I uh, have students walk the dish with me. And that means they have one solid hour and 10 minutes uh, to talk about anything they want. So in some sense, uh, this is a little bit like the dish walk that I might give them in terms of uh, uh, what kind of advice? So this is the dish walk. Now, by the way, this is in conjunction with that class I taught, which was called the Stanford Safari. I convinced one of my neighbors who has a helicopter that I needed to see what the perspective of Stanford was from 1,000 feet. So, so uh, there it is. I might show you some more of those. So that's the dish. Okay. And I have a long history at Stanford, uh, uh, some of you might know. So uh, we learn a lot about teaching, not just from doing teaching, but also by being students. Uh, and so I'll tell you how I uh, acquired my knowledge about uh, teaching from being a student. Uh, um. So the, uh, the first uh, 18 years of my life were actually uh, spent uh, primarily in Florida. And uh, during that time, I was primarily a student. So, uh, so I had lots of uh, uh, experience being a student during that time. Uh, and I kind of grew up in a, in a 50s type family that was surprisingly similar to, uh, to Leave it to Beaver. Uh, and you can guess who I was. Uh, okay. So then I spent the next 18 years uh, getting five degrees in psychology, education, molecular biology, and finally uh, medicine, emerging in 1990 uh, at, uh, from school, uh, as well as gaining ex a great deal of experience uh, in teaching. Now, Michelle mentioned that when I graduated in 1990, you know, I, I started teaching. But the fact is that prior to even beginning medical school, I had TA seven classes. I taught an undergraduate cancer class with over 250 students. I uh, taught three itera iterations of an introductory chemistry class. Uh, I taught the first iteration of my currently main class, which is humans and viruses. I taught several Chautauqua short courses for for college professors. Uh, I was well on the way to teaching 100 day-long medical education classes in most of the states of the United States. I had taught for Stanley Kaplan. I had taught at various high schools and junior high schools. Uh, and that obsession with teaching uh, continued uh, during medical school and into the, uh, and into the present. Um, but that's all by way of statistics. You know, a much uh, more interest are sort of the backstories to some of these things. By the way. Uh, um, these are actually the hands from the original Stanford tree. Okay. Oh, and if you're wondering why that thing is up there, okay. Ooh, wait. Oh, oh, I thought I there. That's why. Ah, uh, because that was me. Um, okay. So these stories are basically plausible fictions, and I think when anybody tells stories about their lives, they kind of make them up and they kind of put things that. That, that they sort of remembered happened, and they try to make sense out of them. And, uh, and that's what I'm going to do uh, uh, during these, uh, these plausible fictions here. Okay. And there are a couple of things that uh, 
Uh, although I'm not going to try, try to draw great lessons out of these. There are a couple of things that I'll draw your attention to. One is kind of the role of, uh, of serendipity and preparation. Uh, and just amazing things have sort of happened to me, and I never really sort of quite understood why. Uh, but I think a lot of it has to do with being uh, well prepared uh, in the right place at the right time. Uh, and so you'll see that from some of these uh, stories. And the other thing I'm going to talk about is a little bit about uh, mentors, angels, and exemplars. Now, a lot of people talk about mentors, and uh, Norman Neymar gave a beautiful talk here about uh, mentors, and he went back all the way to the, the Greek history and how, uh, 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 for, the, for the God, mentor. And, and uh, so in my life, I've actually been sort of much more sort of influenced by what I call angels and exemplars. Uh, and I'll just give you uh, a couple of quick examples of angels and exemplars, and then, uh, and then I'll uh, talk a little bit more. Uh, angels are people who help you in your career for reasons that you never really figure out. They just, they, they just, they give you opportunities. Uh, and I've had just so many people who've done that for me. It's been really wonderful. Uh, and uh, I think here's an example of one. Uh, so uh, Tina Selig just finished writing a book called Ingenious. Now, now Tina Selig is an angel for many people. So, uh, so well, some of you will may know this. But this is the book. And uh, in the book, she actually uh, talks about how my use of photography in my classes. And uh, what I love is the fact that, so I'm in the footnotes right there. It's great. She lists my, uh, my website for photography. But the best part is that I'm here between Jerry Seinfeld and Twyla Tharp. OK. So that's what your angels do for you. They put you somewhere like that. Um, OK. And as far as uh, um, exemplars, uh, I'll give you some examples from, uh, from my undergraduate years. I had uh, a professor named Jean Leroux, and uh, he was teaching an advanced English class. Now, as background to the story, I have to tell you that when I came to Stanford, uh, I knew that I was a brilliant writer, okay, because all my high school teachers had told me I was a brilliant writer. And then I took freshman English. And I, I won't give you the actual words, you know, but he said something like, your writing sucks, okay. So, and of course, I didn't believe it because everybody had told me I was a great writer, okay. And it took me many years to realize that my writing sucked. Uh, and then finally, my last quarter here, I took another English class. And I figured, what are you going to take? So I actually sat in a bunch of classes to shop them. That was one of the things I learned from being an undergraduate here is to shop classes. And uh, uh, there was a guy, Jean Leroux, who was teaching this marvelous class. Unfortunately, it was a class for English majors. And I had taken you know, one class where the professor had told me I sucked. And during that class, it was a seminar for 12 people. And 25 people show up the first day. And, uh, and Jean Leroux says, uh, I'm not going to kick anybody out of this class. He says, I'm going to make it so hard that half of you will drop. Okay, and one week later, I, I persisted. One week later, the class was down to twelve, and uh, and I learned that really uh, there, there's some real value to sort of aiming high in terms of classes. I also learned that uh, with a guy named Norm Wessels, and Norm Wessels used to come to class ten minutes early. He had four chalkboards on two sides, and he would draw on these things with two hands. I never could figure out how he did that. And everybody had to come in early to draw these things. And I filled up more pages of notebooks with these notes uh, because he was aiming high. Okay? And that, that actually, it shows you, it, it, it lets the students see what they're capable of. So those are examples of uh, uh, people who are uh, exemplars, and you pick up these things, you steal them, and you incorporate them into your classes. Uh, so I, I think most of my students uh, realize that I try to aim high in the class. Now, okay. now this is a, uh, a, a more extended example. Uh, well, uh, actually, let me just mention one other story first. Uh, that the first job, and probably the only job I ever formally applied for, was to be a course assistant for the Human Biology Corps. And I was applying for the, the, uh, the biology hard A side of the Corps, uh, and uh, even though I majored in psychology, and I actually, at that point, hadn't taken any uh, chemistry, physics, no bio core, no human bio core, no math. Okay, so, but I decided I was going to go for it. Uh, and I was interviewed by the B-side professor, Arthur Wolf. And Arthur Wolf, I dutifully, ans dutifully answered his first question. He asked me something. 
And uh, he proceeded to disagree with me. And so we, I like, was a little bit taken aback. And we started, I started like, telling my point of view. And we got into a little bit of an argument there. And then, uh, OK, so we were done with that question. He goes on to the next question. And I answer it. And again, he sort of takes exception at what I have to say. And so at this point, I realized this interview is not going well. And so I figured, what the heck? So we spent an hour vehemently arguing with each other. Okay? So, uh, and of course, I got the job. Okay? Uh, and uh, so I think there's a, a life lesson there, you know, again, that you, know, you just sort of go for it, and uh, sometimes you get it. Now, after I got that job, later in the spring, uh, I actually decided I would turn down the job because of a, a breakup with, uh, uh, with a girlfriend. And, uh, and, oh, and so I sent them a note. Uh, and by the way, there was no email, so you, know, you have to actually let them know. Uh, and I never really heard anything back. But at the end of the summer, I was sort of at loose ends. And uh, I get a call from the head TA, this guy, Rob Dorrit. And Rob Dorrit calls me. Uh, uh, you know Rob, OK? He calls me. Uh, uh, telling me when the orientation for the teaching assistants for the Corps is going to be. So I, I tell him uh, that I'm now very interested, but that I had turned the position down. And he said, uh, I didn't really believe you, so the position is yours. Uh, and I had never met this guy before. Okay? So this is an example of uh, one of the angels in my life. And uh, so it turned out to be a really remarkable year, both uh, TAing and substitute teaching in the local high schools. And uh, what's, uh, what's really remarkable is that through Facebook, uh, I've now re reunited with most of the A-side CAs who had, uh, had taught with me uh, back in the, the 70s. Uh, so uh, to a surprising extent like that, uh, teaching has really always found me. Uh, so I've sought it out, but in many cases, it sort of sought me out. Uh, early in my graduate career, I uh, was a teaching assistant for this guy right here, David Prescott, who was a, a leading cancer researcher. And uh, he taught a class. Uh, called The Biology of the Cancer Cell, uh, uh, Molecular Cellular Developmental Biology 315, my birthday, uh, if that means anything. Anyway, I talked during the, while I TA, I talked with David a great deal uh, about cancer and about teaching. And I, I saw him preparing his lectures. And he would hand write out all his notes longhand. Uh, of course, again, just the historical perspective, there were no word processors. So there were typewriters, but he wrote everything out longhand. And each year, he would rewrite out all his lectures uh, to keep everything fresh and to bring himself up to speed. And believe me, David knew a lot about cancer uh, and about the cell cycle. So the following year, uh, uh, he was uh, going on sabbatical. And he asked me if I would teach the class. Now, having a graduate student, uh, much less a young, early graduate student, teach a class was essentially unheard of in that department. Uh, much less the fact that this was uh, essentially the second largest class in the department. Um, so despite the objections of the other faculty, uh, David's seniority prevailed, and, uh, and I ended up teaching that class the next year. So first, I followed David's uh, practice, and I wrote out all my notes. Uh, but, uh, but I gave the class my own flavor with an emphasis on service learning. And that was a term that didn't exist in those days, but it was something that I picked up uh, from being an undergraduate and from taking uh, upper division in human biology classes. And so I actually brought in a lot of activism uh, into the class in the com uh, with the community. So in addition to the biology, the students became involved in the American Cancer Society, in writing letters to Congress, in uh, volunteer for hospice, uh, and various other activities. And so did I. Uh, now, I want you to imagine the first day of class. This is a young graduate student with this class. Uh, and uh, it's in a very large physics hall. Uh, and I actually uh, came to the class, to the hall, uh, with my handwritten notes in, in the previous day uh, in order to practice my talk to an empty hall uh, and work on my delivery and my timing. And, uh, and so now, the class is about to begin. And students uh, are, are sort of uh, strolling in. And uh, the hour is approaching to begin the lecture. And now there's more than 250 students uh, engaged in lively din discourse with each other uh, and, uh, and talking and so forth. So how do you start? Okay, So here I am, uh, prepared with my notes, standing at the podium. Uh, and the second hand sweeps across the, the hour when the class is supposed to begin. You know, how to start. Okay, And then another cycle of the second hand goes around. Then another. 
And then suddenly I go, cancer! And the room is silence, OK? OK? And then in a lower tone, cancer. And then I begin to in recite impressive statistics about uh, the impact of this disease. What a rush. OK? Now, I've adored being at the podium ever since, uh, or at least the virtual podium, since I never understood why most podia uh, actually are tilted so your papers and your computers fall off of them. So. Clearly not uh, designed by a professor. This one's not, so that's good. Now, in addition to being an amazing teaching experience, there were other aspects of this class that would change my life. And this is what happens over and over again. As a result of this class and my involvement and the students' involvement in the community, I was asked to be the education chairman for the Boulder County branch of the American Cancer Society. Uh, I also became much more serious about pursuing a career uh, in medicine. Uh, so. The fact that my undergraduates were coming up to me, my, you know, who I was a couple years older than, and asking me for letters of recommendation to go to medical school, I figured, if they could get in, why not me? OK, so apparently I could. So, so anyway, that's, uh, that's uh, the story of David Prescott. Now, uh, and this is the book that he wrote, so uh, we use in the class. Now, teaching in human biology followed a, a very similar route. So, Shortly after my cancer class, uh, while I was still a graduate student in molecular biology at the University of Colorado, I was attending a wedding. And it was a wedding of the very same Rob Dorrit. And while I was at the wedding, I sat next to the current chairman of human biology, Mert Bernfield. Now, uh, I mentioned to Mert that it, it I, and I had previously TA the core with Mert. Uh, and at this wedding, I mentioned that it would be fun someday to come back to human biology uh, and give a lecture. Uh, two weeks later, he calls me up and he says, uh, I want you to teach a chemistry class to accompany the core. I said, Mert. I protested to him, you know I haven't taken any chemistry, which is actually a bit of a lie, because after I decided to go to medical school, I actually took a year of inorganic chemistry, okay, so, uh, and actually a year of physics. So, so I used part of my graduate uh, time to, to get a year of those two. So I said, uh, Mert, I haven't taken any chemistry. He says, yes. Uh, but you TA the A side of the core, uh, and you injected a great deal of rigor into the human biology core, and you also applied for and got into pro PhD programs in, uh, in uh, molecular biology. Uh, and that was true. So in fact, I got in without those chemistry classes. So, uh, so he says to me, you must know what it takes to, uh, uh, what chemistry it takes to master the biology that you need to learn in the human biology core. Um, so in essence, he asked me to teach the chemistry class because I had never taken it. Okay? Now, I taught this class for the next 13 years, uh, but it gets better. Okay? When I applied to medical school, I was one year shy in terms of an entire, I, I didn't have any organic chemistry, so I was shy of a required year of chemistry. Uh, but it turns out when I applied, they decided I didn't have to te take it because I was teaching chemistry at Stanford because I had never taken it. Yeah, well, that's the way the world works. OK. So, so anyway, as I say, I think there's many sort of things you can do to increase the chance of being lucky. And by the way, one of the ways I taught myself chemistry for that is that I decided teaching, and I need to learn chemistry. And so I applied for a job. This wasn't really an interview. I just said, I'd like to teach at uh, Stanley Kaplan. They said, what are your scores? I said, OK. They said, OK, you can teach for Stanley Kaplan. So not only did they pay me to teach there, they also gave me complete access to all their materials, which was actually worth more than they paid me. Um, OK. Now, in 1989, I was teaching the ninth iteration of the chemistry class. It was my mother's birthday. Uh, it, was, uh, it was October 17th. Uh, it was the day of the third game of the Trans Bay World Series, where, uh, where Oakland was playing San Francisco. And at 5.04 on October 17th, I was in doing a pediatrics rotation uh, at Stanford Medical School. And the third floor of the hospital began to shake. Uh, gurneys were rolling. IV bottles were swaying. Things were falling off of the shelf. Now, I actually remembered, I looked this up, I actually remembered it being 5.07. Uh, not 504. So it's amazing what memory tricks you know, your, your mind will play on you. Uh, anyway, uh, as, as kind of an interesting aside, I recall that day, and I don't know if the rest of what, what the rest of you remember from that, uh, that, uh, that people's reaction to the earthquake had very little to do with their status in the hospital and much more to do with other aspects of their personality. So uh, it was an interesting test to see what people would do. 
Anyway, we turned on the radio, and we heard a report that the Bay Bridge had collapsed. Okay, this was, you know, the, a, a section had collapsed, but we had this vision that the entire Bay Bridge had just fallen into the bay. So we really had no idea. So uh, anyway, I was supposed to teach this chemistry class at 7. This is at 5.04. You know, and so um, uh, I decided that I probably should cancel the class that day. Okay, so anyway, so around uh, 6.30, I went over to the quad uh, in the geo corner where the class was, uh, and klaxons were blaring. That's the only time I've ever actually heard that at Stanford. And the, the building was cordoned off with red warning tape, and uh, pieces of sand, they, they, uh, the, the tan sandstone were lying on the ground. And so I stepped over the warning tape, and I placed a handwritten note on the door of the geology building uh, stating that the chemistry seminar was going to be canceled. Okay. Hmm. So the next day, a picture of my sign appeared on the cover of the daily. <laughs> so they thought that was either shocking or amusing or whatever. So anyway, by the way, I was also teaching on, uh, on Tuesday, September 11, 1999. Uh, I was teaching uh, Human Biology Honors Co uh, College. Coincidence? I'll leave that to the reader, to the listener to decide. So. Anyway, that day I actually decided to go ahead and hold class so we could talk about what happened to the group, which was a very powerful experience. Now, okay, so this sounds like sort of a one-off thing, although I've now told you several, but my appointment in microbiology was something quite similar, okay? I was uh, at, uh, over at the medical school, and a guy named Ed Makarski, another one of my angels, uh, approached me with an offer to, to be the course director for a nine-unit course out of the blue, okay? Uh, and the course was called uh, The Infectious Basis Disease. And this was a real, you know, behemoth. Uh, and this appointment would, this, this job would entail a new appointment at Stanford, namely the, the appointment I have now, a substantial increase in pay and status, uh, a thing that matters a lot to academics is status. Uh, uh, but several other things appealed to me about this course. I would have total control over the course. I would have the opportunity to work with some of my favorite professors from when I was a student, Stan Falco, Lucy Tompkins, Gary Skolnick, and my very dear friend, Paul Bash. Uh, and I would get to teach every single medical student who graduated from this illustrious uh, institution. Now, I can recount similar stories from when I was asked to teach in the Department of Biochemistry, uh, and, I can, and also for the Center for African Studies. Uh, so, and these have all been exceedingly rewarding adventures. Uh, so, as I say, uh, it seems like luck, seems like serendipity, but maybe uh, there's a bit of preparation there as well. Okay. Now, uh, I want to leap a little bit to the present. Uh, too many stories to tell, but I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, humans and viruses, which has sort of been my flagship course. It started as a, a three-unit course uh, and sort of morphed into a 12-unit extravaganza over two quarters. Uh, and recently, one of my students actually created a Facebook site uh, for the class, and uh, there, as you can see, there's now 131 members. Now, this tends to be a pretty small class, and these, these people who have signed up for the Facebook page uh, have gone all the way back to the very beginning of the class. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, in the last week, I actually have received several notes from people who actually were in my section when I TA'd the human biology course, so that really goes back a long way. Um, okay. So, uh, in this class, I've, uh, I've done uh, a lot of different experiments. And one of the things I've done is, uh, is the use of models, uh, three-dimensional models to illustrate various properties about, uh, about uh, viruses. And, and then the students actually make these models, and then they make a PowerPoint, and they present them. So this is called the, the model marathon. Uh, and partly the inspiration for this came from a guy named Mike Yaris. And uh, as a, as a first-year graduate student, he made us build these three-dimensional models of DNA. Uh, we had these toolkits and stuff to build them from. And part of it, the inspiration came from Watson and Crick when you read the, the double helix and you realize that most of what they did was build a model uh, using the existing information and they had sort of a major revelation as a result of that. And we actually, as graduate students, uh, figured out some very interesting things about DNA uh, like the way that DNA could actually uh, form hairpin loops. Uh, that was pretty novel at the time because there wasn't very much information on the sequences of DNA. They were just first coming out. And so we were among the first people that tried to model uh, those sequences. Okay, so I'll just show you. This is an example of uh, when the students all get together and they give these presentations. So here you see all the, the various models. And uh, I'm just going to point out this particular person here because uh, this is Laura Waman. Uh, and she said she built this beautiful model of, uh, of uh, 
HIV, so it's a retrovirus. And she said, all the models in the class are so wonderful that they should go beyond this. And so she actually approached the Cantor Museum and asked uh, if, uh, if, you know, that these should be art. And the Cantor said no. And then later, they came back to me this past year and said, we want to have an exhibit of, uh, of your models. So uh, I'll, I'll show you some, some things from the exhibit in just a second. Anyway, here are just some of the models. This is actually uh, Owen Marisic. So after he was done with his football career, he decided to learn about virology with astrovirus there. Uh, and then here's a couple of my other classes. So this goes back quite a ways. Uh, uh, that's, so these are people who had gone to Stanford Medical School. So. Uh, they became viruses. This woman actually, for her virus model, actually crocheted a, uh, a model of RSV. Uh, and, uh, and I actually approached her, did she have the model, because I was interested in getting this in the exhibit. And she said uh, that uh, she, she didn't know where the model was, but actually uh, it was very interesting, because she had actually decided to crochet this because uh, a friend of hers was, had a kid that was in the hospital with, uh, with RSV. And, uh, and so it turns out that she applied for this very prestigious scholarship called the Soros Scholarship. And they want some evidence of artistic ability. So she actually said, I crochet viruses. And she won the Soros. Uh, this is uh, showing the genome. Uh, here's a yellow fever and various viruses. And they, they're, they're, they're usually quite dynamic. This is Togo virus, as you can see. Uh, Prions. OK, this is an interesting one. So, so a lot of students actually decide they want to use condoms for their models. And what, what we've learned is that and well, they use this to actually model what's called the viral envelope, uh, and which is this thing that sits on the outside of a virus, many viruses. And so what we found is that, uh, is that condoms make good envelopes, but envelopes don't make good condoms. So. <laughs> so. These are mostly Stanford students. So. OK, uh, this one's made out of popcorn. Uh, and then uh, one of my all-time favorites uh, is this one. Uh, this guy turned himself into influenza, which does happen. Um, OK, so this is actually the current uh, exhibit. Uh, it's Adventures in the Human Virus Sphere. This is where the, the, the sphere theme comes up in a lot of my classes. And so you can go see this now. It's in the Rabal, uh, uh, the Rabal room of the, uh, of the, the Cantor Museum. Okay. And, and it's even been picked up by the Huffington Post and by uh, various other publications. So this has gotten some, well, actually, it takes care of that viral infection. Uh, OK. So, uh, so that's an example of uh, one of the things that, that happened. Now, uh, lemonade. So uh, another story I want to tell you is uh, that, that you know, when, when I try to do things at Stanford, sometimes they work, and sometimes they don't. Sometimes people say yes, sometimes people say no. And so when, when somebody says no, I try to make le lemonade out of the lemons. Okay, so, so I was given an extraordinary opportunity to teach two overseas seminars, first in, uh, in Tanzania and then in England, uh, taking people around England to sort of follow in the footsteps of Darwin. And the following year, uh, because I was uh, um, kind of a glutton, and I, I just uh, wanted to keep doing it. I applied for another one, and they said no. Okay, so so I wasn't going to get to go on my third trip, and so I decided, what am I going to do in September? I used to teach honors college for about ten years, and so I don't have any, September's free, and so I actually I think I approached Sherry Palmer, who's here, uh, and uh, asked her, uh, uh, can I teach a sophomore college? And uh, and so she said sure. They said sure, and I didn't even have a proposal. So this is where I gave that list of proposals. Bill Durham said, teach the most fun one. And so I decided I would teach a class called the Stanford Safari. It was something I had thought about for a long time, since what do I know about? I know about Stanford. I've been here for a long time. Uh, and so in preparation for this class, what I did is I asked everybody I knew, what's your favorite thing about Stanford? What's your favorite fact? What's your favorite place? Who's your favorite professor? Everything I could think of. I made a list, and I did them all with my students. OK, so uh, here we are. Uh, uh, in Stone River over there. So we actually met with every living president. We met with uh, all of the people who are running institutes at Stanford, the, the, uh, the Cantor, the, the uh, Jasper Ridge, uh, uh, the Hoover, uh, Slack. So we met with all of them. We met with uh, almost everybody who was a dean. Okay, So we met with most of the deans. And we met with everybody who has university in their title. I figure if you have university or title at Stanford, you must be doing something interesting. So many of you may not know that there's like a university uh, archaeologist, and a university architect, and a university archivist, and a university uh, horticulturalist. There's a university pest controller. Uh, he took us down into the uh, steam tunnels uh, and told us stories about like what happens when uh, uh, things like bed bugs break out in Flomo. And then he pulls out of his pocket a 
jar full of bed bugs. So that was, that was exciting. Uh, there is uh, um, a university organist, uh, Robert Morgan, and his fabulous organ. Uh, so we actually met with all those people. So this is the, the class that we taught. Uh, this is the students made us a cake of appreciation for the TAs and so forth. And as I said, in, con in conjunction with this class, I got my, uh, the view from 1,000 feet. Uh, unfortunately, the students didn't get this, but these, uh, this was a lot of fun. Uh, this is Lake Little Lake, but it's not really a lake. Okay, so, uh, so it's hard to do the genealogy of a course the way you might do a genealogy of a person because so many other factors came in. But in some sense, uh, we could have Honors College up there as well. So Cores Abroad led to the Tanzania Safari, led to the Darwin Safari, led to the Stanford Safari. And then the next year I said, uh, uh, I want to do one of these things, and I said, well, you know, I didn't really want to do the Stanford Safari again because it just felt like it had gone so well that I would just try to be recreating the same thing. And so I taught a class, a three-week intensive class on smallpox. Uh, and again, things that happened just came out of the wall. One of the, the, uh, the students in the class, it turns out that her godmother uh, is actually Dean Julie's mother. Uh, and uh, so Jean Lithcott was, was in... Uh, West Africa during the eradication of smallpox, and her husband, George Lithcott, Julie's father, uh, was actually in charge of uh, smallpox eradication for West Africa. So something that most people don't know about, Dean Julie, and the fact that she was born in, in uh, West Africa. Okay, that, uh, then uh, I, last year I taught a class called the Influenza Safari. I was actually called, uh, these have real names. The, the real name for that class is the Coming Influenza Pandemic. Uh, in June, I'm taking another group back to Tanzania. Uh, in September, I'm doing a class called Measles, Sneasels, and Things That Go Mumps in the Night. Uh, and, uh, and next summer, I'll be taking a group to Madagascar. So uh, all of these things have sort of a, a, sort of a life of their own. This is actually uh, where I've talked about the Stanford Safari uh, to various uh, alumni groups. Uh, it's been rebuilt by uh, the Alumni Association as Stanford's ultimate, to, the ultimate Stanford to-do list. Okay. Okay, now... Uh, I'm going to stop at this point, and uh, I'll take questions. Uh, there's a lot more stories to tell. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, and we started with the dish, and we'll end with the dish. So uh, there's the rainbow. Uh, so it's been, a, it's been a great ride. Uh, questions? Thank you all for coming. It's been a blast. You have a question? Okay. Uh, you put a tremendous amount of energy out just watching you here, watching some of the other things you've done. Uh, is there some way you have to replenish yourself, or does the very act of doing this replenish you? Great question. So, uh, they, the, the motivate, well, first of all, I think that I might. My battery might run a little faster than some people's. But, uh, uh, but mainly, I think you get recharged by the students. Uh, uh, I tend to, you probably saw, I tend to sort of go into sort of a frantic, uh, non-communicative mode before I give a talk. And then it's just wonderful once you're up here. And then, uh, and then afterwards, you, you just, there's, it's a rush. So anybody who teaches knows that. Other questions? So I have a number of my... Uh, my colleagues and angels and various exemplars in the room, not to mention a couple of family members. So thank you all for coming. <laughs> Other questions?